Uh, good afternoon uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is Alastair Stewart and I'll be talking to John Whittingdale. If you have questions that you'd like to put or comments that you would like to make, then it's hashtag EdTVFest, uh, E-D-T-V-F-E-S-T. -E my guest this afternoon is the Right Honourable John Whittingdale, Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. Would you please welcome him? <laughs> the chair of the BBC Trust, Trina Fairhead, said uh, in a piece that she wrote for The Independent recently, Charter Review gives us a chance to codify the relationship between the BBC and the state with the BBC that is both accountable and independent. Do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Charter Review comes around once every 10 years, and it provides an opportunity to think about why we need to have a BBC in this country, what its purpose should be, um, how it should be governed, how it should be paid for. And that has happened every time the Charter has come to be renewed. But this time, it is taking place after a 10-year period during which perhaps more change has happened in the broadcasting landscape than in every, any previous 10-year period. And so inevitably, you then have to ask searching questions about what is the BBC's place in this new landscape. And that is the purpose of the consultation which we have begun sure. uh, to reach Charter Renewal. Crucially, she used the word independence. Do you believe that the Treasury deal on licences for the over 75s damaged that independence for the BBC? Not damage the independence, it's tough on the BBC, of course it is. Um, but I mean, I'm a member of a government that was elected whose first priority was to put the economy right and to get the deficit down. And we made it very clear that we were going to have to find 12 billion pounds of welfare savings. Now, the BBC, as a uh, extremely well-financed public organisation is being asked to make a contribution to that in the same way that every other public body is. Um, the BBC has been receiving uh, approaching half a billion pounds uh, from the DWP budget uh, to meet the cost of the over 75s free licences and the Chancellor had the task of finding savings, particularly in the welfare budget, and therefore he asked that the BBC should make a contribution to that overall objective in the Nearly same 20 way. Nearly 20% of their total budget well, over of course, a five-year period. It, it, 700 million pounds that people willingly part company with in the belief that it's going to help make programmes, not give free licences to folk. Well, willingly um, part with is, is another matter. Of course, they have to part with it. You believe license fee payers are under duress? Well, no, they're, they're, well they're, they're, it's a criminal um, offence not the to Lord pay. Lord Chancellor doesn't I'm want not, that to be I'm, the case I'm anymore. Not, Do I'm you not, back the Lord Chancellor on well, that? That's an, then well, let's come on to that, because that's old, uh, another question. Um, but no, I mean, I accept that most people think that license fee is good value for money, but it is the case that the BBC needs to make contribution. It, the BBC receives £3.7 billion pounds in license fee income. The reduction that they're going to face as a result of taking on the cost of the over 75s so is being phased in. It doesn't even start. Mm. Uh, till 2017-18, I mean, it's phased in sure. after that. And we discussed, we had robust discussions with the BBC. They, of course, uh, were not happy with that, and they asked for certain uh, concessions in return. Sure. Things like the closure of the iPlayer loophole, um, the fact that they'd no longer uh, be required to give up part of the licence fee for the broadband rollout, and there were various other things. And they we can also change the their mind in 2020, can't they? Because the policy then reverts to their control. So they come to whoever succeeds you, or it may still be you for all I know, says, we're going to change that now. Actually, we're going to start charging again. Would Her Majesty's government say, well, that's fine, it's entirely a matter for you now? Well, what we said at the time of the last election, and it was in the manifesto, was that the over 75s free TV licence was a pledge, and it would stay for the duration of the parliament. Uh, and we've made it very clear that we stick to our pledges and therefore it is protected. Now, what happens in the next parliament, um, we have said it is a matter for the BBC. Once the BBC take over the cost of meeting it, it's not unreasonable to say to the BBC, um, you can amend it if you want. Now, and lot, start charging again well, if lot, you want. There are lots of things you could do. And, you know, we're talking five years off after a general election. Um, I don't know what will be in the manifestos of the political parties at that election. But, for instance, you could argue perhaps that it should be restricted only to households where all the occupants are over 75. 
Or you could argue that because life expectancy is rising, therefore you might increase the age. All of these are options. Was that all but, discussed in the exchanges and no, the debates? Because, because you will know perfectly well that Chris Bryant has a Freedom of Information request in to have the full detail of that debate because he doesn't believe that we collectively know all that was agreed. We've seen the letter that you wrote to Lord Hall signed by yourself and George Osborne. That's about all we've got. Yeah, well, that is the agreement. Um, and it was... No addendums, annexes, no, no, no addendum. nods, winks? No, absolutely none. Was uh, Mr Murdoch involved in the discussions? No. Did Mr Murdoch meet with the Chancellor of the Exchequer 24, 48 hours before this was announced? Well, I saw the report that that had occurred. My answer is I've not the faintest idea. All I can tell you is that any suggestion that this was a deal somehow influenced by Rupert Murdoch is just conspiracy theory gone mad. The reason that this deal was done was a very obvious one. It is that the government has a priority, which is getting the deficit down, and this represents a significant contribution towards achieving that aim. The idea that somehow it was dictated from New York by Rupert Murdoch is... Clearly, no, I was suggesting that he might have popped into Whitehall to dictate well, it rather than I, doing I, it across I have, the pond. I have no idea whether or not he popped into Whitehall, but I don't believe that he would have wanted to come and talk about this. And even if he had, it would have had no influence. And you're very but, confident about granting an FOI or the authorities granting an FOI? Absolutely, absolutely. There is no, I'm unaware of any conversation that took place with Rupert Murdoch. Thank you. Um, do you think that the BBC's global reputation, which, as you told the House when you launched the Green Paper, is, and I quote, second to none, would still be so if it ceased in its efforts to quote you back again, trying to be all things to all people? Well, I think that's a different debate. Um, the BBC's global reputation is built on several things. Producing some of the most successful, some of the best programmes, uh, around the world because they've been sold into countries all across the globe. Well, no, I'm, programs like Sherlock are watched in you know, ev almost every country and the BBC gets rightly a lot of credit for that. And then you have the entirely separate division of the BBC, which is the World Service, uh, which is something I'm a huge supporter of. Um, now, I mean, I do think that is an enormous asset to this country. Um, the what they call now soft power. Britain's image abroad is enormously strengthened by the success of the BBC, and actually not just the BBC, mm. um, because... But isn't Britain... that a direct function of it seeking over decades to inform, entertain, yeah. all the rest of it, educate, and also to attempt to be all things to all people, whether you love classical music on Radio 3 or whether you love Bake Off, it's there for less than three quid a week. Yeah. And the BBC does provide an amazing range of programming for relatively small amount of money when you... £750 instance, million pounds well, less it, it, right you, now, and you reviewing the methodology of funding that may go to subscription, may go to a hybrid, may go to goodness knows what. My point specifically was to you, you were good enough to say second to none, and yet you are tempted to tear up the blueprint that's made it second no, to I, I, What I'm tempted to do is to say, this is an opportunity to have a debate. And it may well be that the conclusion is the BBC should continue doing absolutely everything that it's doing at the moment and there should be no change. But I do think it would be extraordinary, given the enormous changes that have taken place, not to at least have that debate. Mm -hmm. And I think given that since the last charter was renewed, there has been this explosion of choice there's so much more programming available for people to watch, either um, through the public service broadcasters or through subscription services or online, through download and streaming. That leads you at least just to say, well, given all these things have come into the market since we last looked at it, does the BBC still need to be doing as much, given not that there are all these other providers? Your mind is open to the possibility that the answer to that question will be, yeah. Yes, yeah, completely. Totally. Yeah. And would it surprise you if that was the answer? Um, I mean, one of the things that I think one of the misconceptions out there is that, you know, I as the Secretary of State sit in an office in Whitehall and say, BBC should stop broadcasting that programme. You know, it's, it's not uh, distinctive enough or they should do more of this. That's not my job. It would You're be... quoting yourself, John. Well, You no. have said precisely those things on the record, well, both as me... chair of the Select Committee and now as Secretary of State. I have expressed views... And of course I have views. Now, one of the difficulties, when I got, I have to say, I didn't 
think that I was going to be Secretary of State. It was a pleasant surprise. And because I've been Select Committee Chairman for a long time, inevitably I've talked about the BBC. I've been at Edinburgh. Um, I used to come to the TV festival and I'd always have the 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning slot, which was a discussion about the future of the BBC. And inevitably, virtually nobody was there because they'd all been in the George the night before. Um, but, you know, this is a debate that has yeah. been taking place in every Edinburgh sure. that I've ever known. Yeah. Um, but this time, they think you mean it. Well, this time I'm a Secretary of State. But one of, the, one of the sort of drawbacks, if you like, is that I have taken the job having a long history of expressing views. Charlotte Higgins came to see me because uh, she was writing a book about the BBC. And we spent two hours talking about the BBC, and I gave lots of quotes, which were just personal views. And I, you know, at the time I talked to her, I didn't realise I'd be doing this job. If I had, maybe I'd have been a bit more restrained. But in it, whatever my view is, I don't determine what programmes the BBC should show. That's the job of the BBC. What I can do is to give a general steer, which we do through the Charter sure. and the okay. Agreement, about the areas where, you know, the requirement to be distinct. because I want to come on to that specifically a little later in this conversation, but I also want to put something else to you, because you and I have known each other a long time, and I've been doing this job a fair old while as well. And I can remember when Norman Tebbit got very angry with Kate A.D. about Iran and the rest of it and what have you. And not only that interview that you gave, but also uh, famous and celebrated books, Pinkos and Traitors. Let me put it bluntly to you, as someone who used to work in Margaret Thatcher's private office and has that heritage that you rightly have described, that this is unfinished business. Ideologically and politically, there is a stream within the Conservative Party that you are not averse to that says, I don't like the BBC the way it does things, and I don't like its editorial line. We've now got a majority. We can now get down to business that should have started a long time back. It's absolute nonsense. I mean, there are times when the BBC have driven me into a fury because I haven't liked some of the things they broadcast. But I'm not alone. It isn't just the Conservative Party. You go and talk to the Labour governments. They will have said exactly the same thing. I mean, remember, you know, the Greg Dyke resignation and all the WMD row that took place. The BBC is always going to occasionally broadcast things which the government doesn't like. But it is absolutely right that the BBC's editorial independence is paramount and that the BBC should not be pressurised by government as to what it can and what it cannot broadcast. That is a completely different uh, question uh, to the issues in charter renewal, which are the big overall principles. Yeah. Why do we need a BBC? How do you govern it? Precisely why it? I wanted to distinguish the two points. Um, we invited, as you know, um, one or two luminaries to, to <laughs> apologise for the Dear John uh, questions, as it were, and we've only selected two or three of them. Um, but I'd like to play you now the one that uh, came from uh, jointly, as it were, but individually, Joan Bakewell and Claire Enders. May we play the clip now for the audience? My question to you is, how will our creative economy survive the dismantling of the public service broadcasting system that begins with the decline of the BBC? I wonder whether you agree with me the BBC is far more than a wing of the entertainment industry and that by virtue of its unique history and its global reach, it's a pillar of civic society in this country. And then I'd like to know how that role can be sustained with its broad influence on the culture at large in the face of such rapidly changing technology. You take away from the BBC in any way significant sums of money, and, and you know a good old bit about economics as well, it does drive huge parts of the economy. This festival is always brilliantly attended by independent producers, men and women who make their livelihoods and create wealth and what have you, from what is cast out by other people. And secondly, your own official departmental website talked about the BBC just being another voice within the debate. Can you address both of those points in the light well, of what Claire and Joan said? What I'd say to Claire is, uh, who is talking about dismantling the BBC? I've never suggested dismantling the BBC. When I read today, Tony Hall's done a piece, which I expect a lot of people have seen in Daily Mirror, and it says in it, some people even question whether we should be doing entertainment. Well, if you ever get the chance to have Tony sitting here, I'd just like you to ask him, who? 
I mean, I've never questioned it. As far as I'm aware, nobody is questioning it. Nobody is talking about dismantling the BBC. We're having a debate about the role of the BBC in a very different broadcasting landscape and whether or not it needs to do absolutely everything that it's done in the past or whether there are areas where perhaps it should do more. That is an open debate. But this idea that somehow there is an ideological, as you put it, uh, drive to destroy the BBC is just extraordinary. And I do have a slight sense that you know, the people who are rushing to defend the BBC are tilting at windmills. I mean, they are trying to have an argument, but has never been started, certainly not by me. But something like Strictly Come Dancing, you were fairly dismissive of, which millions of people thoroughly enjoy every week, and your partner in the licence deal, Chancellor of the Exchequer, spoke specifically about BBC imperialism. I mean, that says to me, two very senior members of the government think a lot of what the BBC does is a bit questionable, and also the number two guy actually believes that the expansionary plans of the BBC are like some evil empire. Well, I mean, that's why Tony wrote what he wrote in the mirror. That's why Danny Cohen said what he said at his press conference yesterday. That's what folk believe, John. Well, in that case, they haven't actually read either the Select Committee report, which I was one of the main authors of, or indeed the Green Paper. Um, The Strictly question, I mean, that was part of the Charlotte Higgins sort of general discussion. Um, And I said, you know, a very popular show at Saturday night going out at that time, it's debatable. Actually, having thought about it, as I said uh, more recently, I think Strictly is absolutely uh, appropriate for the BBC to do, because, as I think Tony said in his piece, you know, if you were a commissioning editor and somebody that came along and said, you know, I want to spend an hour on, sat- uh, on prime time in the evening uh, with a show, I mean, I think tonight... Um, the debate is whether or not you can do a creme brulee without a blowtorch or something. I mean, that is not obviously a ratings winner. Yet, it is one of the most successful programmes the BBC have done. And the BBC took a risk, and it's been hugely successful, and that's exactly what the BBC should do. They should take risks. What they shouldn't do is produce programmes, this is a personal opinion, because it's entirely up to them, which, you know, are absolutely uh, indistinguishable from a populist, commercially driven programme. If they can achieve something which is, you know, risky... Um, unusual, distinctive, but also incredibly successful and attracting huge audiences. Fantastic. That's what they should be doing. EastEnders is a London-based yeah. version of Coronation Street. Well, should it have done it? Yeah, I, because I think EastEnders is different to Coronation Street, and I think um, the writer, scriptwriters of, of EastEnders always tried to have certain messages within there which are quite important as well and address quite difficult issues. That's not to say Coronation Street doesn't do those things. Yeah. So what that, would you cite then as an example of something that the BBC are doing well, that they ought not to? Well, as I've said to you, it is not my job to tell the BBC you shouldn't be doing this programme. It would be wrong for me to do so. But because you're Secretary of State and sit in the Mm. Cabinet and have the ear of the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, what you may see as throwaway lines passing comments in a lively post-Green Paper debate are taken as what you think and the guy who's going to make the final decisions. But I'm not making those final decisions. But decisions about what the BBC broadcasts is a matter for the BBC. It's not for me. Um, Now, I can obviously express views, and also I can seek to set a general strategic direction in the areas where the BBC should attach priorities. That's what we do as a part of the renewal of the Charter. Uh, But I'm not, as I say, going to tell the BBC, stop broadcasting that show. I mean, there are... The the one which has created a lot of uh, debate uh, was The Voice. Uh, The Voice has been very popular. Now, I think... The fact, for instance, that The Voice was contested between BBC and ITV, you, know, you can say, well, all the result of that was was to force up the amount of money that had to be paid for it eventually. It was going to be shown uh, on free-to-air anyway, should the BBC get into bidding wars with another free-to-air broadcaster. I think that's an interesting question. Um, and again, it's a, you know, I'm not going to tell them they can't do that, but I think you know, it is it is worth at least raising whether or not that's a good use of licence fee payers' money. But ITV were furious when the BBC got it, and it did reasonably well for the BBC. BBC audiences are content. They don't care how much went to the company that ITV now owns that made it. Hmm. But, but... It was, it was well spent licence fee it, money it, to entertain it, it was, well, and the amount... That the BBC got over us. But the amount, I mean, obviously the amount that was paid for it was yeah. more than if 
the BBC hadn't bid against ITV. You believe so, in markets, John Whittingdale. Well, I, you're, a, you're a Tory. I am, but the, bear in mind that this is a state-owned state finance broadcaster. I'm perfectly happy for you know, Sky and BT Sport oh, we come on to, to that in a minute. bid yeah. enormous sums, and they do bid enormous sums. That's a decision for them. Okay. But bear in mind, this is essentially public money. This is licence fee payers money. And you know, we require people to pay this licence fee every year, and therefore there is a duty on government, uh, which we carry out, through inst for instance, through the National Audit Office, to ensure sure. that we get good value for money. Okay, let's talk specifically then about the, the licence fee. And if I start to accelerate, I apologise. It's because I'm trying to protect time for, sure. for these good people to have, have questions as well. There are a whole range of options and learned research papers about what the best way of funding the corporation is, ranging from status quo through to hybrids and, and yeah. all the rest of it. What struck me reading it was that, that actually the licence fee is a little bit like Churchill on democracy. It's the least worst option. Yeah. A lot of people have said that, and there is, I think actually that was one of the uh, conclusions of the Select Committee report, that at the moment, and we looked at the alternatives, um, advertising I don't think is the right way forward, it would obviously diminish the revenues going to all the other broadcasters that do depend. Um, you can move to a straight state finance, you know, a transfer of money from the government to the BBC, but that does make it much more vulnerable to um, governments changing their mind. Uh, we went to look at uh, Holland, where they did do that with all sorts of assurances and guarantees that it was ring-fenced, it wouldn't be touched, and then it was cut six months later by about 20%. Um, so we decided that wasn't right. And the difficulty with subscription, which I'm sure you'll want to talk about a little more, the difficulty with subscription is that you can't, even if you wanted to, you can't do it at the moment because there isn't the technology in the home. It's, it's possible, but you, it would first of all require every household in Britain to have a conditional access system in the home that allowed you to turn it off. I have a letter, well, a clip, which addresses precisely that point. Can we play the David Elstein piece? By the end of 2017, 95% of homes are going to be within reach of superfast broadband. And so any smart TV in those homes or any smart device could receive encrypted BBC channels over the internet. And frankly, any digital TV could be upgraded to receive encrypted BBC channels for about £30. So why not next year set a date well before 2020 to replace the licence fee with voluntary subscription? And may I just add, possibly pick up the telephone to people like BT or, or whoever the, the technocrats are who are doing it totally successfully for Sky at the moment and say, we'd like some of that, then it gives us a real viable option. Well, David touches on actually another one of my departmental responsibilities, yeah. which is broadband rollout. And he's absolutely right that we are on target to achieve 95% coverage of Superfast uh, by 2017. But there is also a question, firstly, that, that leaves 5%. Now, 5% is quite a lot of people. It's sort of 2 million households. Um, and you can't just say to them, well, you haven't got Superfast, so you, I'm afraid you can't see the BBC any longer. Um, and there's a question about whether or not you could uh, deliver it uh, at super fast speeds, and super fast speeds you know, are up to, up to 25 megabits. Um, we are moving very fast. We are going to reach a situation where I hope it, reasonably soon we will have ultra fast, mm. which is up to 100 megabits across the whole country. It's an enormous challenge. It's another issue which is sort of sitting in my entree and I'm talking to my sure. colleagues in government. But you can also it. pick up the phone to Gavin Patterson and say, get your finger out. Well, I, I pick up the phone to Gavin Patterson very frequently to say, get your finger out, but you know, it's not going to be achieved overnight. When but 5% get... would be a block. Oh, I think so. 5% is a lot. If you're talking about making the BBC only available on a subscription basis on IPTV, I think every broadcaster believes that the time is going to come when television is delivered through IPTV. Sure. I think it I would have a fiver then on way that off. answer combined with your previous analysis of the other options that have been examined, that the licence fee remains a runner oh, well, for, for the foreseeable future. Well, what the Select Committee report said was that, you know, for this charter period, um, and I, you know, I, wrote, I was chairman of the committee, but we haven't, you know, we're now in the process of the Green Paper consultation, but the, obviously I looked at it quite closely when I was chairing the committee. At the moment, I think to move to subscription is not really possible. There will come a time. 
And maybe we should start thinking about the preparations if we wanted to go down that road. But for the moment, in the short term at least, you know, I will be very interested to see what suggestions come in, mm. but I slightly sure. take the same view of you, but certainly for the moment, the licence fee, or something like it, yeah. um, is th That's probably your hybrid. the best option. No, actually, it's, um, there's another issue which... Uh, Not a politics, is a, surely. Well, there's this issue which is another part of the debate, uh, which is decriminalisation. Yes. And you, as you know, there are people who argue very strongly that it should no longer be a criminal right, offence. I said at the very beginning, not least no. the Lord Chancellor himself. Yeah. Well, no, I mean... The, uh, as Michael Gove said it several days ago. Uh, part of the, 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 the um, noise around this debate is, is some slightly exaggerated reports in newspapers. So the idea that Michael Gove... Whittingdale dismisses Gove as noise <laughs> shock. No, Whittingdale dismisses reports of row uh, with Gove okay. shock. Um, Michael and I have certainly had no such row about okay. it. I mean, Michael, his responsibility is the courts. Yeah. Um, it is the case that there are about 100,000 convictions a year uh, at the moment for non-payment, and some of those, a very tiny number, uh, who then don't pay the fine end up in prison. But instinctively, but, you would like to stop that as well? Well, I th the, the difficulty is, and it, we asked uh, David Perry to look at this, and he produced what is a very thorough analysis, which said, well, if you go to decriminalisation, then there are all sorts of consequences which create real difficulties. One of the uh, most obvious is that it is likely to lead to a very significant rise in evasion. Um, that would obviously okay. cut the BBC's right. revenue, so we are thinking about other things you could do to deal with that, to prevent a huge increase in evasion. Let me so that's one thing where I think you, you might be uh, able to be specific on it. I'm not saying you're being dismissive. I hear exactly what you say about that legal jurisprudence argument. You have said on the record, uh, with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, that the BBC can have CPI rises to the, to the licence fee over the next period if it achieves a certain level of efficiencies and savings. What are they? Well, what we said is that um, the BBC ought to be seeking to make the same efficiency savings as we're asking every other public uh, body to do. I mean, what it shouldn't be is a sort of get-out clause saying we don't have to keep looking for doing things, you know, at better value, more efficiently, because we've got this cast-iron guarantee. So the two things uh, which I said... Uh, about the CPI increase. Well, firstly, the BBC should still be looking for efficiencies the whole time, as every body that is funded by public money should. But do you, do you give a number or a percentage ambition, a target? No. I mean, the Chancellor has asked heads of departments, including you, to think the impossible of 20 to 40% cuts in departmental spending. Well, that's... Ought you not to say something similar to the BBC? Well, as I've said at the beginning of our discussion, we did. That's, that, that was one of the reasons why we said to them, look, we're going to ask you to take on the over 75s, because we do think you should make the same contribution that other parts of government are making. But, um, yeah, but that's, that's, that's the 20%. You want further savings. Well, no, what, what the departments are being asked to do is, is look to find savings. Now, that's not necessarily through efficiency. I mean, I'd love to be able to cut... 20% uh, just through efficiency. It's probably not possibly. I'm, I'm going to have to make some very, very difficult decisions to meet the Chancellor's targets. But that's about you know, what my department and what every other government department does at the moment. But uh, you so said, but to be crystal clear, because it's a crucial point, the deal on licences for the over 75s that is about 20%. Well, as things stand at the moment. You have said, in addition to that, to secure CPI indexation of the licence going forward, you want further no, cuts and no, efficiencies. No, we haven't, we, haven't, we haven't said that we are demanding specific reductions. We're just saying, well, no, we, we will... Well, why don't you give them CPI now, then? Well, if they've done it. Because, this, because one of the risks is that the, the over 75s is being faced, and it doesn't come in for another few, it doesn't start till 2017, and then it's over three years. So, and actually, the, what we said, um, and the other reason is that uh, the Conservative Party manifesto, and I said at the beginning, you know, we don't break our pledges. Um, the manifesto said that the licence fee was frozen during this charter period. Uh, and so that is a cast-iron guarantee. Once we get into the new charter, we've said, you know, the licence fee will have been frozen for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now, that's been quite a significant pressure on the BBC, and we recognise that, and therefore... All other things being equal, we would expect that the licence fee would begin to rise again in line with okay. prices. 
you've been very clear throughout this first part of the conversation, and I'm going to begin to draw it to a close so we can find time for folk here as well, that you published a green paper, and all students of politics will know that that is a discussion document, genuinely. It is not a white paper intention to legislate yet. It is the discussion that, that, that comes before that. But you've also appointed a group of folk to advise and guide you through that process, which your old chum, Norman Fowler, uh, described as the officers of an unprecedented attack, as it were, predominantly ex-commercial or current commercial voices clanking, said Fowler, with special interests and past opinions. The cards are marked and stacked against us. That is not Tony Hall, that's not Danny Cohen. That's Lord Norman Fowler, former Times journalist, former Conservative cabinet minister. Is he wrong as well, making noise like Gove? Um, well, it's, it's not like Gove at all. But, that's also uh, very true. <laughs> but, um, I mean, on that I don't agree with Norman. I mean, the two things to make clear. First of all, the advisory panel has no formal role. It's not going to be taking decisions. It's basically a group of people who have interesting ideas, who have a lot of experience in different areas uh, of the BBC's activities, to act as a sort of standing board, to throw ideas around. But it's the government that will take the decisions, not the advisory panel, and it is only in a panel. And they are appointed on the basis that they have had experience in broadcasting or other areas where the BBC is active. And therefore, you know, I mean, they wouldn't have the expertise if they hadn't got a history of working in the sector. Some have been in the BBC. Some have been working um, for newspapers, for radio stations, for uh, other broadcasters. That's why they're interesting. That's why they can bring a degree of knowledge, which is just valuable in terms of throwing ideas about. But they are predominantly of the commercial sector former classic FM boss who's on the record as being opposed to Radio 3, Dawn Airy, who I worked with and is exclusively commercial sector, Stuart Purvis was my boss for a long time, Ashley Highfield, Johnson Press. Ashley Highfield, BBC executive yes, board. Yes, but also now Johnson Press, and yeah. they believe that the BBC's imperialism has cost them dear over the years as well. My point being that the critical mass of that panel of advisors is very, very obviously in one direction. Well, I, each of them brings quite a variety of experience. You know, every single one has done a variety of things. Ashley Highfield, he was on the BBC executive board. He worked for Microsoft. He now runs Johnson Press. You know, Colette Bow, former chairman of Ofcom, but also now president of a, a Voice of the Listener and Viewer. Darren Henley, yes, he was a uh, global and classic FM. He's now a chief executive of the Arts Council. Mm -hmm. you now, each of these people has a whole variety of experiences which make them interesting people to listen to when it comes to discuss the BBC. I'm having discussions with a huge number of people. Um, but as I say, the decisions are going to be taken by the government. Sure. They're no, not I, being I taken I accept that. What I'm trying panel. to get at, and it, it, it began at the process of the conversation earlier on, is, is the atmosphere that people perceive, the tone that seems to have been set. And I just hear what you say about that, but any reading of their CVs would lead any reasonable, objective person to a conclusion in the same way that the behind-closed-doors deal over the licence fee leads people to certain conclusions. I mean, is that an approach, particularly over the closed-doors approach to the licence fee, which, as chair of the select committee, you criticised? Well, Are you proud of that? Well, let me say about the deal. I, one of the reasons why I said that the CPI increase was dependent, for instance, on the outcome of Child Review was I didn't want to prejudge Child Review. There's no point in having a debate if we've already reached a conclusion before it's even started. So there is a debate, and lic the licence fee settlement and the charter renewal is part of that debate. What happened within the first few weeks of the government taking office was a very specific requirement which was to do with the budget and the economy. It was not, sure. no, you know, that. It, it was not but, an attack but, but on by, the BBC. By it was dealing, a... you and George Osborne, dealing with Tony Hall directly, hung the chair of the trust out to dry and allowed Bryant to say to you in the House of Commons, the trust is bust. Well, you did that. Well, no, we didn't. I mean, Rona Fairhead was involved in these conversations as well. I mean, I, you know, at the same time, I've called Tony Hall to say, look, Tony, we have this problem. We got to find this money, and I'm afraid we're going to have to ask you to make a contribution. I called Rona as well. I had his meetings with Rona. The Trust was very much involved in all these discussions. Now, whether or not, more generally, the Trust is the best way of governing the BBC is a wholly different question. Chris Bryant 
you know, appears to have reached conclusions before we've listened to all the evidence, but I think he, on this, has made some good points. I mean, the, the select committee report, and you know, I, uh, that in a sense was an expression of my views before I ended up sitting in this chair. You know, the select committee report was pretty clear that we didn't feel that the trust in its present form was working and that we needed to look at alternatives. Sure. One of the key things about that is that there is a consensus, even amongst some BBC folk, that there is still a lot of fat there is a multiplicity of management layers and so on and so forth that perhaps the trust should have been tougher on and its predecessors should have been tougher upon. But is that to do with you or is it to do with the trust? What has how much a director of television gets paid got to do with you or the prime minister? What has a layer of management got to do with you or the cabinet secretary? Well, you're absolutely right that decisions on the running of the BBC are for the BBC executive and then the trust has a regulatory function. But part of the problem is that, you know, some people feel that it's been conflicted and it hasn't carried that out. It's not the government's job. The government can certainly set overall um, ambitions for sort of public sector pay rises saying, you know, we mm. generally don't think that people should be given huge increases at a time when we're having to ask the public sector employees you know, either to you know, restrain themselves to 1% or something. But it is ultimately a matter for the BBC. And part of the difficulty is that when uh, the BBC in the past sometimes has been asked to find savings, they've immediately said, well, this means, oh, we're going to have to cut the programme budget or we're going to have to close BBC4. Actually, there are a lot of people who, despite what undoubtedly has already been achieved through DQ, DQF and you know, quite substantial savings, nevertheless think there is still scope for further efficiencies in terms of the bureaucracy and the management of the BBC. One of the reasons why W1A is such a, a wonderful programme is because, you know, just in the same way the thick of it and the US Prime Minister had a ring of truth about Whitehall, people think that W1A has a ring of truth about it in the BBC. And you do say, you know, head of values, what on earth is that? You know, I mean, it's fiction, but actually it's fiction that works because, you know, you think, well, I think there's an element of truth there. With the BBC wrong to commission through their director of audience research a number of people who turned their TV sets off and came to the staggering conclusion that they missed the BBC. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I really was astonished by this because, you know, it, it was if they were us, if they were, they were making a, a, an argument, you know, about how are you going to react if the government decides to close down the BBC? Well, it is not surprising to me that people would say they would be very unhappy if the BBC didn't exist. I would be very unhappy if the BBC didn't exist. This is not a debate about whether or not the BBC should exist. So asking me this question, you know, can you live without the whole of BBC TV, the whole of BBC radio, BBC online services? Well, now, of course they can't, and nobody's asking them to. Thank you. Let's leave the BBC and move to Channel 4, and we have a question from Luke Johnson. Is it right that the taxpayer in 2015 still owns Channel 4. Does it really make sense for the government to control, in the digital era, two whole public service broadcasting networks? It is mentioned regularly in George Osborne's list of possible privatisations. Do you want Channel 4 to remain a UK broadcasting asset? Um, well, let me take a step back. Uh, it's it's, it's quite interesting to hear Luke say that because I can remember Luke appearing before my select committee to say that Channel 4 couldn't survive without public money. Uh, it wasn't economically viable. And you remember he and Andy Duncan made that case quite strongly. Actually, Channel 4 has done pretty well since then and seems to be doing fine without public money, which is very good. Um, what I think is important is the remit that was given to Channel 4 when it was set up by a Conservative government, which was that there should be a second um, public service broadcaster with a specific remit to address niche audiences, minorities, yeah. to take risks, um, and that I think has been very valuable. But if somebody and like I, Liberty I said, if somebody said, like Liberty said, we can do that, we'll buy into it, I mean they may not because the price implications may be staggering, as a point of principle it doesn't worry you that Willie Whitelaw's lovely idea all those years ago could be owned and quoted on the Wall Street stock market rather than remaining a UK asset. 
I would answer by saying it, 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 this is not just about Channel 4. This is right, no, I want pro, to know right. specifically well, about I'll Channel 4. Right, I will, but, but it's a general point, and it applies to Channel 4. I think it is absolutely right that the government set down requirements on broadcasters, and there are varying degrees, you know. Um, all the public service broadcasters have certain requirements as part of their licence. It may be um, in terms of specific programme genres, it may be in terms of regional production. Sure. It's fine. And Channel 4 has a much more specific requirement to address particular minorities, which it does pretty effectively. That has nothing to do with ownership. You can deliver, market to market. You, um, you can deliver a, a, a remit through the broadcasting license. So you, say, you say, you know, if you are going to have a license to broadcast, you have got to meet these requirements. And I would have no intention uh, of changing the remit of Channel 4, and I would want Channel 4 to continue to be serving that remit. But you wouldn't refer, were you able to, and I genuinely don't know whether you could, a bid from the United States of America or Australia or wherever for Channel 4, as long as the remit was intact. Well, it's, it's not a question of referring, because, of course, we, we own Channel 4, yeah, so yeah. it would be a question of whether or not we decided to sell it. Um, I haven't received a bid. Um, the ownership of Channel 4 is not currently under debate. Do I completely say there are no circumstances under which we would ever consider it? No, I don't. Okay. What I do say is that the remit of Channel 4 is a priority and it is not going to change. Sure. You have a relationship totally different with ITV, but you addressed yourself the issue of requirements to yeah. the licenses and so on and so forth. And that's been a very lively debate over the last decade. Does it matter whether the majority ownership of ITV is vested in the UK or could that also be abroad? Liberty have been state building for quite some time. Well, again, um, I would say that there are certain things we expect from IT, uh, ITV and, and you represent one of them, uh, which is uh, an alternative authoritative, objective, impartial news service. It is a requirement that ITV should provide, and I think that's terribly important. Plurality is essential, and we would obviously continue to do that. Now, that is not the same thing as does it have to be owned by Britain. Now, of course, under EU law, if a German broadcaster, for instance, wanted to make a bid for ITV, they are allowed to. Um, because we can't discriminate between a British and another European country. Should an American one, that is again a different, that's not covered by EU sure. law, what's but your, your... In my instinctive reaction is, is, is I, in principle, I don't, I'm not going to run to the hills and say it's absolutely unthinkable that an American could own it, but, uh, but you know, when a German can, an American can't. But you know, ITV is doing pretty well at the moment, all credit to them. Um, this situation hasn't arisen, whether or not it does, wait to see. But the thing again, which is important as you know, sitting in the desk that I sit at, is delivering the requirements which we think are important that the public should have available. And that is, for instance, plurality in news and its various other uh, requirements uh, that we impose on all the public service broadcasters. All right. Thank you. Questions? Let's have the house lights up. And if you put... I can't see people. I can now. Brilliant. I'm going to start with microphone four. If you could pass it along to... If you would say who you are, where you're from, and put your question to the Secretary of State. Thank you. Yeah. Hi there. My name's uh, Claire Hungate. I run Warner Brothers Television UK, formerly known as Shed Media. So we're very proud to have wall to wall within our portfolio of companies. Your question. Yep. Wall to wall are actually the producers of The Voice. So The Voice isn't made by Talper, it's made by Wall to Wall. And I don't want to go into the details of the negotiation between the BBC and ITV, because that's obviously confidential. But I do feel the need to just correct Mr. Whittingdale respect to, re respectfully that the BBC did not pay more than ITV offered for The Voice. We made the decision to go with the BBC purely based on creativity, based on editorial, and what, where we believe was the best home for The Voice. Ah, oh, okay. Um, and just to add also that the numbers that have been published, um, one in the green paper, which bizarrely references an article from the Daily Mail as the budget for The Voice is incorrect. Okay, I'm going to park it there, but thank you for the clarification. <laughs> Microphone two. Gentlemen, four in on that line. Oh, you've got the mic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, John McVeigh from Pact. Hi, John. Um, <clears throat> 
I wanted to take you back just to the end of your um, discussion with Alistair there, which was about the government's powers to change remits and regulations, which I think is the right arm's length way to deal with public service broadcasting and get away from the sort of heated debate about you telling Come on, us. question, please. I, I'm coming to it. Uh, no, now, I have, otherwise I'll move on. All right, fine. The question is that, given you do have those powers, could you please review uh, the regulations that Ofcom have to in, uh, enforce the requirements on the other public service broadcasters other than the BBC okay. to commission more children's programming? Thank you. Um, Claire, very interesting. Um, I wasn't aware that, you, that you'd chosen to sell to the BBC on grounds of creativity rather than the uh, highest price. Um, and congratulations. I'm not sure that would be um, a particularly <laughs> frequent outcome. Um, but it doesn't change the question which I raised was whether or not you know, it is sensible to have two UK free-to-air broadcasters, one of which is publicly financed, bidding against each other. That's just a sort of a, a philosoph right. philosophical question because it inevitably... It is a core philosophical question. It's You're going a free to, marketeer. It's, you know, but as I said to you, you know, one of them is not... Uh, is, is, is financed through the taxpayer, mm. if you like. I mean, is it a good use of taxpayers' money? That's not so... I mean, it, it's a much more general question than specifically about the okay. voice. And on the point um, on, about... On, on, on John's question about the public service obligations... Uh, on other broadcasters. Um, I mean, we keep those under review the whole time. Generally, this is a government that wants to relax um, regulations where we feel it is possible to do so. Children's television is absolutely essential. It's one of the areas where I think the BBC does an absolutely fantastic job um, because ITV has largely moved out of children's programming at a younger level, although having said that, I went to the screening of the new series of Thunderbirds, and as, a, as I grew up with Thunderbirds, to see it back on television slightly differently, admittedly, it was fantastic, but all credit to ITV for bringing it back. And, um, and the problems and, as well, I hasten and, to add, you attended to it. And then, you get you know, cultural balance. And, you know, Channel 4 and Channel 5 all, all target different uh, age groups, but the BBC is the prime supplier of children's TV, and I think that's incredibly important, and okay. I hope we'll continue. Microphone three, and then microphone one, and then microphone, what are you? Two, three. Hello, uh, Martha Carney, I'm a presenter at the BBC, so that's my interest. Hello, Martha. Uh, hello there. <laughs> I'm sorry um, about the umbrella that broke. <laughs> We're Twitter friends, and in fact, I've been tweeting John Whittingdale's remarks. I won't repeat all of them. Question. But one, from, one question from a member of the public. Oh, when John said that uh, it was going to be the government making the decision uh, rather than the advisory panel about the future of the BBC, uh, this person who's tweeting says, one problem, shouldn't the licence fee payers be making the final decision? Well, the licence fee payers should have a voice, and they most certainly will. One of the things that we did... Uh, was to talk to the Trust about the process of charter renewal. And we asked the Trust to go out and consult as widely as possible. Um, and they're having roadshows up and down the country to give people the opportunity. And that is certainly a very important contributor. But at the end of the day, if you like, the government, as the elected uh, parliament and the government itself, who are elected by the people to represent them, it is right that this is a decision ultimately that is one for government. But listening to you know, the views of the BBC, who will be publishing, I think, next month, the views of other people uh, who are involved in the broadcasting world, but then also the views of the, the listeners and viewers. And it's absolutely we will take those into account. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. I went that way, didn't I? Uh, or did I go here? It was you, wasn't it? Number one and then down here Hello. to the front. Hi, Catherine Rushton from the Daily Mail. Is it good the beat? Sorry, this is strange. Um, is it good? Can we, Catherine, we lost you. I'll try again. Is it good for the BBC to be having Alan Yentob negotiating on its behalf for the charter renewal, given his record negotiating with the government over kids' company? Um, well, the, the issue of Alan Yentob and his involvement with the kids' company and his role in the BBC is a question for the BBC. Um, whether or not you should argue that he should be involved in negotiating charter, as far as I'm aware, he, I've not had any discussions with Alan about the charter and all, and I don't think he is in the, you know, it's the lead of... It's in his of, job of, description. Well, I mean, it, as a senior executive of the BBC, I suppose inevitably he's going to be involved in the debate, but he's not 
you know, the, the BBC's contribution uh, to the Charter Renewal debate is going to come out. I think Tony's making a speech in about two, three weeks' time. I've no idea to what extent Alan's been involved in it. And the issue around uh, the kids' company is a, is a matter for the BBC to decide. Does the Daily Mail believe that the Secretary of State should dictate who is on the BBC panel, just as a The Daily Mail's very interested in what he has to say. Oh. <laughs> Big shareholders in ITN as well. Good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Microphone two. Hi, Henry Mance from the Financial Times. Do you believe that the BBC's news coverage is biased towards the left? Um, there are occasions when I've been uh, very annoyed by the BBC's news coverage. Do I think there is a general bias towards the left? No. I think there has been, and, and I, there are many people who've worked in the BBC who've said this, so, and they're probably a better place to say it than me. I think the, there has been a tendency for the BBC to have a certain view of the world and to find it rather um, hard to understand that some people might take a different view of the world. And that, has led to criticism over their coverage of the Middle East, over some religious questions, over Europe, over tax cuts and spending decisions. And it certainly is not partisan. I mean, the idea that the BBC is backing one party or another in general election, I've never believed that. Um, and I think the BBC tries very hard to be objective. But you know, the, that doesn't mean that they're immune from criticism. And the BBC have been open in accepting there have been occasions I know when they've misjudged things they I know have not understood the degree of public feeling over Europe over immigration some of these issues but when the question if I may add coming on the tail of the FT which is a very fine place to be the question I opened with when Rona talked about the compact that would exist between Her Majesty's government and the BBC you would not want to include any judgment of editorial impartiality into any powers that were seen to be vested in your department. That has to be a matter still entirely and exclusively for the corporation. No, not exclusively for the corporation. It is so who else should make that well, judgment? That is, that is one of the debates we're having. It is absolutely essential that the BBC is seen to be absolutely impartial and Ofcom objective. Ofcom do it rather well for us. Right. Now, I think it is imp as part of that requirement, it is necessary, I think, to have a procedure whereby somebody who feels that they've been unfairly treated can make a complaint and have it examined. At the moment, that is done by the BBC Trust, uh, whereas, as you rightly point out, every other broadcaster, it's done by Ofcom. I'm not convinced that people feel that it is right that the BBC Trust decides that the BBC has got it right or wrong. Um, we haven't decided yet whether to give it to Ofcom, sure. but Ofcom do carry out that function for other broadcasters, um, and certainly there is an argument that maybe You've been generous in this conversation, both to me and to colleagues out there, about the hunches and the instincts of Whittingdale. <laughs> is your hunch or instinct that the BBC would be a good place uh, rather, Ofcom would be a good place for the BBC. Um, in terms of this specific so, issue... In terms entirely of Henry's point about well, impartiality. I, I would say that Ofcom are doing a good job in terms of the and regulation the would of, the, uh, of complaints over Channel 4, over ITV. I think they probably could do it for BBC. Uh, whether or not that's the right outcome, we haven't yet decided, but you know, a lot of people do hold that view and have expressed it. And is John Whittingdale one of them? Uh, John Whittingdale is waiting to see the results of the consultation. <laughs> Right, I think I've got time for two more, have I, Steve? Yeah. Okay, fine. Shall we go three and one? Uh, Glenn Campbell from BBC. I'm a journalist at the BBC. Um, John, as you're in Scotland and as the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon will appear at this <laughs> event tomorrow, what's your response to SNP demands for a more autonomous BBC Scotland with potentially £100 million extra of licence fee money to spend? Thank you. Well, the BBC has a duty to um, address the requirements for the nations and regions. Um, that's not just about Scotland, it's obviously about Wales, it's about Northern Ireland, and it's about the regions of England. That doesn't mean that you sort of should divide up the licence fee exactly in proportion to the populations in each area, but it does mean that it needs to uh, be always aware of the requirements. But my answer to the SNP uh, is that we had a uh, referendum on whether or not Scotland should be independent and Scotland decided that it was part of the UK. And it is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Um, and it reflects the whole of the UK. 
ITV are said to be talking to UTV, or UTV is said to be talking to ITV at the moment, also says the FT and various other learned organisations. Because of the devolution environment, forget independence because that's been resolved for the time being, is there any reason why ITV PLC shouldn't buy both UTV and STV? Um, I think, obviously, we want to receive advice from Ofcom, as isn't always the case about whether or not there were consequences for competition or, or plurality, etc. In principle, I would say probably not. I think you and I have, have debated the history of this in the, at the time when ITV might have uh, acquired UTV. Obviously, the situation in Northern Ireland was much more tense then, sure. and therefore there may have been specific reasons why there was a, a, a concern about what might happen to UTV. Obviously, we've moved on a long way since then. Um, so I'd want to look at it, but I wouldn't say absolutely not. I, okay. you know. And ditto STV? Yeah. OK, fascinating. Thank you. Final question from the audience is microphone one. Uh, it's Jonathan Stadlin from Knickerbocker Glory. Uh, I've got two quick questions. The first you one was... You have one quick question. <laughs> uh, well, you're, you said that your conservative forefathers um, started Channel 4 to create a niche television channel for a youth audience. Does that sound like BBC Three to you? Um, and secondly... No. Stop the... Um, well, it was, I didn't say specifically for a youth audience. I mean, it, it was Channel 4's remit is to take risks and, you know, to, to seek to serve minorities who are under-provided for in the rest of uh, the broadcasting landscape. And, and I think Channel 4 does that quite well. Um, the extent to which they've succeeded in the youth audience, they haven't been particularly successful at the very young age groups, but obviously, you know, the E4 type audience. I mean, programmes like Skins, for instance, uh, which certainly, you know, my teenage children uh, were great devotees of. Um, Channel 4 has been very successful. Um, BBC Three has produced, you know, some great programmes uh, which have been successful for that audience. Whether or not, you know, that means that BBC Three should continue um, as a broadcast channel or where, whether um, it should move online as it's proposed, that's a matter ultimately for the BBC and the Trust to decide. Uh, we will be... Uh, Again, these are decisions which I, I don't take. Uh, my concern is that BBC should continue to provide for an important audience. Yeah. How they do that is a matter for them. Final point, if I may, from, from, from here, and it is the last point to conclude. Danny Cohen, I mentioned earlier on, is widely reported this morning for the comments that he made about Crown, which he defines as being an absolutely classic piece of potential BBC television that... that tells the story of the relationship between Buckingham Palace and, and, and Number 10 Downing Street, it was in negotiations over money, but also particularly over international rights, as our friend was talking about there uh, on The Voice. And Danny said, it, we, we can't do it. We deeply regret that we can't go down that road. Uh, we heard the other day that BT have bid and successfully got cricket in Australia. We know that Discovery has now got the license for the Olympics and what have you. This is potentially a precarious, my word, moment for British broadcasting, the largest player of which is the BBC. Can you reassure this audience that you are fully appraised, not of witterings on the margins, but of what is really at stake here? Well, what I'd say is that actually what that illustrates is what a fantastic time this is to be a consumer of television. You have a huge number of new entrants who are commissioning and spending vast amounts of money on original content of high quality. The fact that Netflix wants to spend, I mean, it's reported £50 million on a 50-episode series covering the history of the relationship between the monarchy and parliament and the people is extraordinary. Um, the BBC haven't got an exclusive license for producing very high-quality drama. Um, there is a lots of uh, high-quality drama that's being produced uh, on the main UK channels, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, and also on Sky and now Amazon, Netflix, you know, Netflix, House of Cards, um, Orange is the New Black. It's, you know, there are great shows being produced on all these channels. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean the BBC shouldn't still be doing it. Obviously they should. But it seems to be slightly strange to say, isn't it terrible that you know, the BBC isn't involved but when another channel is willing to spend a lot sure. of money. But my uh, point is this, and it is my final point, that in that circumstance, your job as Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport should be to defend that tradition, enhance that tradition, 
reassure that tradition rather than what I think you've done, even with some clarity today, you've set some of it to one side, is create an atmosphere with the green paper that that very tradition is under attack. Well, I mean, it was never our intention to create that impression. I think, you know, speaking entirely honestly, the fact that we had to take a very difficult decision for the national economic interest, which was about balancing the books of getting the deficit down, and we asked the BBC to make that contribution. The fact that came, that came so close to the publication of the Green Paper was unfortunate. It happened because we had to get on with Charter Renewal, because actually there's not that amount of time left. It runs out next year, end of next year. So we needed to get that underway pretty fast, and we needed to take a decision pretty rapidly about uh, the deficit. And that, those two things, as you I'm sure not uh, uh, believing necessarily yourself, but you, you suggested that might be all part of some sort of secret conspiracy of the government to attack the BBC. It was never that. You know? I, I would rather those two things had not come as close as they right. did, because I think that has created an impression which is entirely wrong. To avoid us being under attack from these good people or the organisers of this festival, we must call it a day. Ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in thanking the Secretary of State for joining us today?